Good morning. We want to welcome you to Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church. My name is Scott Conahill, and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor of this great, great ministry. For more than a half a century, God has allowed Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church to shine the light of Christ to this world, to share the love of Christ with the people in our community, and to shape the people of Christ so that they can do great and mighty things for them. If you're visiting with us today and you're a first time guest, we want to welcome you to our service and we want to invite you to come and be a part of what Again, we want to say thank you for joining us for our service today. It is our prayer that God will minister to our hearts as we worship Him together. There wasn't anything before God. He was there before anything else was there. He made everything else. There has never been a time where God was not. God is and will always be. He's God. He's eternally existing. God has always been, and God will always be. This is where He's different than us. Every one of us had a beginning. God does not have a beginning on record because He's always been. This is a Free Will Baptist Hour, a time of worship and teaching of God's unchanging truth applied in our world today. This week, Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church on Old Cherry Point Road in New Bern invites us into their Sunday morning worship service. Well, right now, let's rejoin Pastor Scott Coghill and the congregation at Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church for the pre-recorded broadcast of the Free Will Baptist Hour. It is a joy to have you today. I'm so glad that we get to worship and praise our God together. If you want to do that, we want you to lift up your voice. Sing this song with us, oh God, our help in ages past. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Written so many years ago, but the truth are true today. Let's sing it. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Oh God, you are, you are our help, you are our helper to glad that our God is our hell. Aren't you glad for that? Let's sing this third verse. Before the hill in order stood, for earth received her fame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. One more verse. Sing it from your heart this morning. Past, past. 
The sun is shining bright. My heart is filled with gladness here above the cares of life. But I've just come through the valley of trouble, fear, and pain. It was there I came to know my God enough to stand and say,
Good morning. You glad to be in God's house? I hope so. We've come today to worship the Lord and to give Him praise for His great salvation. Aren't you glad that Jesus still saves? Let's sing one of our favorites together. We will remember. Sing it out. We will remember. We will remember. We will remember. Stop and give you praise for great is thy faithfulness. Sing that chorus again. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise for great. You're our creator, our life sustainer, deliverer, our comfort, our joy. Throughout the ages, you've been our shelter, our peace in the midst of the storm. With signs and wonders, You've shown your power with precious blood. You've shown us your grace. You've been our helper, our liberator, the giver of life with the way. Sing the chorus with us. We will. We will remember. We will remember. darkest valleys we will look back at all you have done and we will shout our God is good for he 
is the faithful. Aren't you glad he's faithful this morning? Amen. Sing it out. Hallelujah. This verse, and I'm glad that I can still remember. Amen. I still remember the day you saved me, the day I heard you call out my name. You said you loved me, would never leave me, and I've never been. God's people said, Amen. is good. Well, aren't you thankful for that? Take your Bibles this morning, turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1. Gospel of John chapter 1. If you're visiting with us today, thank you for being here. We say this on a weekly basis, but we say it because we do mean it. You've honored us by being here today. And it's hard to 
understand what a church is all about in just one quick visit, but we hope that you'll come back and visit with us. We thank God for what he's doing in our church. We thank God what he's doing in our people. And uh, we thank God for what he's doing through us. And so I'm glad that I serve a God who's actively involved in my life. Aren't you? And a God that can still be good even in the valley. Even in the valley. So thank you for being here. Love the Gospel of John. How many of you, whether it's the Gospel of John or not, how many of you have, of the four Gospels, you have one Gospel that you're partial to over the others? Raise your hand. That's not a bad thing. You're like, well, I can never be partial against any other portion of Scripture. That's not what I'm asking. He just reads easier, you know? It just kind of scratches where you itch a little bit. And, and honestly, it, as much as I've read through the Gospels, it, mine changes. It's almost like my favorite Gospel is the one I'm reading. It's like my favorite song. I, I know Christy's heard me say this a hundred times. That's my favorite song. And yet it's a hundred different songs. It's just the one you're reading. It's the one you're in. And, and there have been so many times, I remember years ago, preaching through the Gospel of John. And I made a statement. I went back and looked at the series uh, this week and went back to a statement I made at the very beginning. And I, I said, uh, John is my favorite Gospel. And then I went back a year and a half ago when I was starting in the Sermon on the Mount and I made the same statement about Matthew. <laughs> Matthew is my favorite Gospel. And uh, I don't think I'm a liar, I just think whichever one I'm reading, that at the time is it's kind of my favorite. Um, each gospel writer has very distinct characteristics. I'm glad that God allowed those men to pen under the complete inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I might add but allow them to pin in their own personality. He allowed Matthew to look at the Gospels from a tax collector business standpoint. He allowed John Mark to write the Gospels from a, a disciple, a follower of Christ, a minister of the Gospel, who had gone away and had been unstable at times and now had come back and, and God gave him liberty to write about the stories that made an impact in his life and the way they did. He allowed Luke to write the Gospel of Luke as a physician. He identified things and saw things as maybe only a doctor would. But then you have John. And I believe if, if Matthew wrote with his, with his mind, of course, with their heart, they're writing the Word of God, but with his mind knowing his background, and John Mark with his mind knowing his background, and Luke with his mind knowing his background, I don't believe there's any doubt that John wrote the Gospel of John from his heart. We know John as the beloved disciple. He was the one that we would consider to be the closest to Jesus. He was the youngest of the disciples, and yet what a wonderful, wonderful book it is to know who this man, John, was. He starts off the book differently than all the others. In fact, I believe if you were to take, I think I'll go back in 50 years and look at the statement I'm about to make. But out of the four Gospels, I definitely would say if I had to take it chapter by chapter, my favorite chapter of all the first chapters is the Gospel of John. I believe if you only had the Gospel of John chapter 1, I believe it would answer almost every question you have doctrinally in the Christian life. John 1. I want to read the first 12 verses together, and uh, I want you to see how deep-rooted this supernatural doctrine 
that's embedded in each verse is and how today may God help us see how it applies to our everyday living. John 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who? The Word. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And that light that He brought, that He was, shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, let's not add any confusion. This is not the same John that's writing. The John that's writing is John the Beloved. Uh, the John he's writing about is John the Baptist. In fact, John the writer never mentions his own name in the Gospels. He references himself but never calls himself by his name. And yet, anytime you see the name John, he's talking about John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him, not John, but through Christ might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Now, verse 10 has to confuse us some. Not necessarily because of what it means. I do believe it's laid out simply. But it, can we fathom today the fact that, that the world was made by God, and yet God robed himself in flesh and came to live in the world. And the world knew him not. What does that mean? That simply means that they, they didn't understand who Jesus was when he came. They were looking for a Messiah, but they were looking for a different kind of Messiah. Verse 11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And I love verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Aren't you thankful for that today? That not everybody received him. Not everybody understood. But those that did receive him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. What do we see in John chapter 1 this morning? I want to give you three truths that I think are undeniable. Three truths that I think simplify these first 12 verses. First of all, I want you to see the principles of Christ. I went back and forth on what to title this one because I do believe what we see are definitely principles, but I also believe they could serve as proofs. John here is legitimizing who Jesus was. John here was stating for fact, for supernatural fact, for inspired fact, for divine, God-sent fact, that Jesus Christ was exactly who Jesus Christ claimed to be. John was stating this in his writings. So it's either principles of Christ or proofs of Christ, whichever ones you think are more applicable. But notice this. He said in these principles of Christ, he said, first of all, we see principles or proofs of Christ's eternal existence. Now, this is going to be huge for you one day when you get a knock at a door and there's several folks out on your porch and they want to come talk to you about a false religion. And the ones I'm talking about are Jehovah's Witness. Now, I am a witness of Jehovah, but I am not a Jehovah's Witness. And they're going to come tell you, oh, no, 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 Jesus and God are not the same. 
And my friends, today I want you to know, yes, they are. We see proofs here in John 1, proofs of his eternal existence. Notice verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. Now the Word, we understand, who is the Word? How do we know who the Word is? Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is the Word? Jesus. So in the beginning was the Word. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God. What well, John said, Jesus was there too. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Was God. Now listen, you will never completely understand the doctrine of the Trinity. If you're waiting to completely understand it, to believe, then you're never going to believe in it. Because you're never going to fully understand it. I'm not even sure when we see it in heaven, are we going to be able to completely understand it. But listen, folks, I believe it's true. I believe that we have one God who is eternally existent in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You say, how? <laughs> if I knew that, I'd be God. <laughs> but the Bible does teach it. The Bible says, in the beginning, Jesus was, and he was with God. And yet he was God. In those few words, John informs us that the Word has existed for all of eternity. At the beginning of time, there was the Word. He already existed. He was already there, and things were created by Him. If your child says to you at four or five years old, where did God come from? Don't you love their questions? And then you think, oh, this is easy. Well, God didn't come from anywhere. And then they say, well, where'd he come from? If he, doesn't, if he didn't come from anywhere, where'd he come from? He's always been there. He's never had a beginning. He was there before anything else was there. He made everything else. There wasn't anything before God. There has never been a time where God was not. God is and will always be. He's God. He's eternally existent. Then your child is going to ask, but how did he get there? And you're going to say, ask the preacher. And I'm going to say, ask your parents. He's been there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and he will always be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. God has always been, and God will always be. This is where he's different than us. Every one of us had a beginning. For me, I had my official grand entrance into the world on August the 25th, 1978 it was a great year. That is, by record, my beginning. God does not have a beginning on record because he's always been. And so has Jesus. He's always been. We see the proofs of his eternal existence. We see, number two, the proofs of Christ's deity. The proofs of his deity. You say, what do you mean? How do we see the proofs of his deity? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. Jesus himself said this. He said, I and my Father are one. Jesus Christ is God. He is equal, co-equal with the Father, just as He is the Holy Spirit. It's not like there's God, and then there's Jesus, and then there's the Holy Spirit. 
No, there is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit, and they are eternally existent. Three persons, three distinct personalities in one God. In one God. And yet this passage screams, the Gospel of John screams the deity of Christ. Please hear me. If Jesus Christ was not God, if he is and was not the sinless Savior, then there's no way that the sacrifice on the cross could have pardoned our sins. No way. What John tells us in these short verses is everything that makes God who he is makes Jesus who he is. Everything. We see his deity. Number three, we see the proofs that Christ is the creator. And whoa, 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 whoa. I thought God created everything. Please reference back in your notes to subpoint A and subpoint B. He is God. Well, why do they call him the Word? Well, what's interesting is the parallel that, that flies back to Genesis 1. Because the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Here it is. This is good. And then God said, How did God create the world? with his word. No wonder John referenced him as the word. He is the word. He is the living, breathing, spoken word of almighty God. Christ is, is the creator. It says all things, verse 3, were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He created all things by him and for him. Colossians chapter 1 tells us who is in the image of of the invisible God speaking of Christ and is the firstborn of every creature. Now please don't misinterpret that. The firstborn is, is, is referring to two things. Number one, it's either referring to the origin of all creation or the rank of all creation. And I can agree with both of them. He is the origin. Nothing was created without Jesus creating it and anything that is created, Christ still has preeminence. He's the origin and he's the rank, for by him, Paul said, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, that are visible, that are invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. By the way, I think that about sums it up. I think everything in the life and everything outside of this life is encompassed in that description. All things are before him and all things because of him consist. He's the creator. It's a proof. I think another proof we see in John chapter 1 is not only a proof of his eternal existence, not only a proof of Christ's deity, not only a proof of Christ as the creator, but also see a proof of Christ as the giver of life. Christ as the giver of life. Notice, if you will, in verse 4, in him was life and the light was the light of men, and the light shineth into the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Where did life come from? It came from God. There was no life and is no life apart from God. John said later in 1 John chapter 5, he says, this is the record, verse 11, this is the record that God hath given to us, I love this, eternal life. How many of you here are here today and you're thankful for eternal life? God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son, by the way, because of that truth, it just stands the reason, the next verse, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. 
Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. When he was describing to those disciples not to let their heart be troubled, and he began to describe a picture of heaven and where he was going and why he was going, Thomas said, Lord, we don't know what, what you're talking about. We don't know where. We don't know how. And Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. See, Satan would have us believe that the only life there is is life in the world. That fulfillment only comes from sin and the flesh. That the only way to truly have life and to truly have happiness, and now he's commercialized this lie, is to give in to the God of this world. Well, my friend, today, I'm not telling you to give in to the God of this world. I'm telling you to give in to the God who created this world. His name is Jesus Christ. Satan's a liar. He's always been a liar, and he always will be a liar. Always. There is only one true life giver, and that is Jesus Christ. And the life he gives, my friend, number one, it satisfies. It satisfies. You can live in this world for 20 years and try everything the world's got, and ultimately it will never satisfy you. But you spend 20 seconds with Jesus, and he satisfies. Remember the story of the woman at the well? She's coming to a well because she's got to get some water. She had made that trip many, many times. Jesus begins to converse with her, which was, again, was odd. She was a woman. It was during the day. That was kind of not customary in those days. Number two, she was a Samaritan. He was a Jew. Number three, he's the Savior. She's a sinner. She'd been married multiple times. She was shacking up at that point. And now we see Jesus talking to her, and he's talking to her, trying to paint pictures to her about the gospel. And Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you would tell me and ask me, request of me, to give you something to drink. Now again, she's a little slow. She says, well, you don't have anything to draw with. Evidently, he didn't have a bucket. He didn't have a pail. He didn't have something to send down to the bottom of the well to get the water. And then Jesus said, well, let me try something else. When you drop your bucket into this well and you get water out, you're going to have to come back. Because this water right here will only satisfy for a little while. Now, now how many would agree with me that, I mean, I love sodas just like anybody else. Uh, we're, we're in the birthplace of Pepsi. You got to love Pepsi. You know, amen? If you don't, we pray for you. Uh, Mountain Dew, you know, things like that. I, 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 I like all that stuff. Of course, now I'm in the diet, you know, because I, I like eating like my honey bun and drinking a diet cola. This makes me feel good. It kind of kind of makes my conscience a little callous, but I feel a little better about myself. But w when it's really hot and you're outside working, you're outside doing something, it's really, really hot. And how many are looking forward to some hot weather? Yeah, I'll remind you that in July. But... It's really hot, and, you know, as good as Mountain Dew is, and as good as Pepsi is, and all these, your, whatever your favorite drink is, and, or even as good as, like, Gatorade, and, and even as good as, as sweet tea. How many like sweet tea? That's the redeemed. <laughs> Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Nothing, nothing is as good as cold water. You drink so much that, that, that you get sick that if you move real fast, you can hear it sloshing on the inside. That ever happened to you? You're like, that's odd. Hope I can sweat that out. But after a while, you want some more, don't you? You're satisfied for a moment. But there's always going to come a time when you need more. Please hear me this morning. All the world has to offer you is temporary 
satisfaction. But what Jesus said to that woman at the well still stands true today. But the water that I give to you, you will never thirst again. Satisfies. This life satisfies. This life saves. This life that he's talking about not only will satisfy your soul, but it will save. That's what he's talking about later in the passage when he says, and this life is the light of men and the light that shineth in the darkness. He came to bring life. He came to bring it more abundantly. And the life he gives not only satisfies you, but thanks be to God, it saves you. You remember when Jairus came to Jesus in desperation, he fell down at his feet. The Bible says he besought him. He begged him that he would come to his house because his daughter was really, really sick. And while he is there, he gets word that his daughter is no longer sick, but now she's dead. You know the story? And I can almost sense and and Jarius, the Jesus, I'm sorry, I was too late. Do you understand today that it's never too late to come to Jesus? Never. Jesus says, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to come. She's not dead. She only sleeps. Well, that was one thing to say to them, but now he got back to the house. There's all kinds of people there, family, friends, scoffers. Pharisees, they found their way to everything. And the Bible says that Jesus said, she's not dead, she's only asleep. And, and, and they're like, are you insulting our intelligence? The Bible even says that they laughed Jesus to scorn. And then Jesus, being God, he made them all get out. And the Bible tells me that once he had put them all out, he took her by the hand and he called saying, "Maid." Arise. And her spirit came again. And she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. Not only did she wake up, but she woke up hungry, which means she woke up healthy. Can you imagine the crowd? Here comes this girl eating a chicken leg, walking out. I thought she was dead. And listen to me. Before you met Christ, you were dead. But when you called on Him, and when He spoke into you, He breathed in you life. And life more abundantly. You're saved. And the Bible gives us proof. Proof. Oh, my friend, listen to me. Don't be on the defensive in this world. There's no need to cower to the enemy today. Everything that they believe, every philosophy that they believe, every doctrine that they follow, it is built on shifting sand. But thanks be to God today that if you are a child of God, if you are a blood-bought Christian today, your hope and your philosophy and your religion and your faith and your belief is all built on the rock of Jesus Christ. And there's a proof of that. And when the world comes against me, I stand firm with God's Word, knowing that Jesus Christ was just not something or someone we made up. There is proof. There's proof. There's proof in this book. There's proof as soon as you exit this building. When you look around, you say, what kind of idiot wouldn't believe there's a God? My friend, today, there's proof right here. Because not only did he speak the world into existence, but many years ago, he spoke life into my life. He spoke redemption into my heart. He spoke salvation into my soul. And John's writing and saying, look what he did. 
and look what he'll continue to do. You've been listening to the Free Will Baptist Hour, today featuring a message from Pastor Scott Coghill at Pleasant Acres Free Will Baptist Church, located at 2911 Old Cherry Point Road in New Bern. You're invited to join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 11. Sunday school begins at 10, and our Sunday evening worship is at 6.30. We're also the home of New Bern Christian Academy, educating the mind and instructing the heart. To learn more about our ministry, give us a call at 252-637-2704. That's area code 252-637-2704. Or check us out online at pleasantacreschurch.org. That's pleasantacreschurch.org. Well, thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll be with us again next week at the same time for another edition of the Free Will Baptist Hour.